Let me say I'm glad to fill in. It's humbling to fill in for a general, particularly uh, with the times that we're dealing with today. Certainly understand that uh, they have things that, that are higher on their agenda. And we wish him well and all of our, our uh, troops well in their endeavors. I want to talk with you today about controversies. Really more about a single controversy of which you all are aware. But just to begin by saying that controversies in general are an inevitable part of the political process. I don't think that uh, that will come as a great surprise to anyone in this club. That's the system that we live in, in this country. Uh, the, the system of give and take, of compromise, of open discussion. If we were a totalitarian country, there would be few controversies, except those that might be grumbled under the hearing or, or outside the hearing of officials. But there are good controversies and there are bad controversies. Just to mention another controversy briefly that's going on right now to let you know just the elements of what we're attempting to deal with, the controversy of curbside recycling, which I'm sure if we went around the room, there'd be a number of views in this room about whether or not it should be continued. Let me just tell you that it boils down to this. First of all, I don't know anyone who is not in favor of environmental excellence for this community. Everyone wants that. We are the most transformed city in America, and we've gotten to be that way because we're paying close attention to the environment. That's something that Republicans and Democrats and Independents all agree on, I believe, in this community, at least all those who wish the community well. But first of all, any recycling program has to make environmental sense. And so what we've been trying to weigh in the mayor's office and in this administration is whether or not spending 20 to 25,000 gallons of diesel fuel a year to collect paper mostly and a few bottles and cans and then having most of that go to the landfill, 50% of it, makes any sense from an environmental standpoint. The other sense, and I'm sure that in this club, dollars and cents is something that you think about. I bring that up because dollars and cents that has, relates to something that we're going to talk about in just a minute. When we talk about recycling, we go through the numbers with people and we talk about where we are, what we've been doing, and whether or not what we're doing is the right thing. We all ultimately get down to one thing that almost everyone says, well, it just makes me feel good. Well, feeling good is great, but we want to be rational and reasonable and practical about it. And any time you change the status quo in a political position, you encounter turbulence. You encounter controversy. It's a necessary part of the system. So we're working on that. And let me say just to lay anyone's fears at rest, Orange Grove is an important part of our solution. We are looking and will have a win-win-win situation for the city, for this community, and for Orange Grove. So, secondly, the one I really came to talk about today, the homeless issue. Again, is status quo adequate? Think about where we are and where we want to go and whether status quo will do the job. I just left a meeting of the homeless coalition. People gathered from agencies all over the city, county, and state who collectively have been attempting to address this issue now for a couple of years. And so we were examining with them the course that we're about, and we've met a number of times, this is not our first meeting, and to double check our path, to say are we going in the right direction? What are the questions that we hear out there? What do we need to be addressing? And the homeless issue comes down to this. Every city of any size, Chattanooga is no exception, has a homeless population. It's more than just those poor individuals that, the see on, that you see on the street pushing grocery carts and carrying heavy packs or whatever, are those unfortunate people who are struggling with mental illness. 
It also involves families. It involves children. It involves people that would surprise you. If you have an opportunity to see the film, the, uh, the video film that was produced here in Chattanooga independently just a few months ago, it showed up at the Memorial Auditorium just a couple of months ago to a very large audience. Watch that film. Community Kitchen can connect you with the source to that film. But you will see people in there very much like ourselves who fell through the cracks at some point. If you're wanting to deal with the, with the elements of a city, you have to deal with the homeless population. And I think we all would admit that the status quo is not adequate. If you want to address it, there are any number of ways that you can approach the problem. Of course, compassion is the first way that you might choose to address the problem. Compassion for the individuals involved. And that's where the faith-based initiatives, our office, uh, Al Chapman, who couldn't be with us today, our uh, Office of Faith-Based Initiatives takes a role, plays a role in pulling in the churches and pulling in foundations and others to help address the problem. Compassion is a wonderful driving force, but that might not be adequate to resolve the issue by itself. If you want to look at it from a downtown development standpoint, that's really a sort of a cold way to look at it. And I have to tell you that I approached this problem first from a compassion standpoint, and then I looked at all the elements, and I did go to other cities to see what other cities were doing, and found that other cities had looked at their downtown, which is where traditionally, in almost every case, the homeless population tends to congregate in the downtown. They said among their leadership, the people in the business community, we have a homeless population. We have people panhandling on the streets. Some of these cities were tourist-oriented cities, and they said if we're going to deal effectively with this so that it's not a, a commanding element, an overpowering element in the downtown area, we have to do something differently. So there are things relating to our downtown, our aquarium, our tourist areas, our riverfront, our Walnut Street Bridge, where we have homeless people sleeping on the bridge at night. That might surprise you. They do show up after most of the visitors are gone, and they get up and leave before the tourists are out walking in the mornings. But that's what's going on down there. Um, downtown development, if you look at where the rescue missions are, the shelters, the Union Gospel Mission across the street from a brand new elementary school, God bless them. That's a wonderful resource in this community that has served for decades. But I know, and many people know, they would like to be somewhere else. They're in much too visible a location. They don't really wish to be there. Their buildings are deteriorating, and they're difficult to man manage and maintain. And likewise for the rescue mission. It's located up on 8th Street, almost across from UTC, one block from the new Brown Academy new elementary school. So there are elements already in our downtown area that would like to be elsewhere. And if you look at it strictly from a downtown development standpoint, that's one way to address the issue. Is status quo adequate? Are we happy with the, things, the, way, the way things are now? Probably not. But if you really just want to look at it from a dollars and cents standpoint, just like that other controversial issue. Let's talk about that for a minute because people have said to me, all right, you want to do something with the homeless. How are you going to pay for it? My friends, we're paying for it already. It's estimated that this community is spending just on the services of agencies more than $7 million on the homeless issue already, $7 million per year. We have estimated last week in calculating the, uh, the cost of incarceration conservatively a million dollars a year that this community, county, city, and others are spending to incarcerate people whose principal crime is homelessness, vagrancy, whatever you wish to put it. Well, why is that? Because when a homeless person is arrested and put in jail, they stay there. 
they don't bond themselves out. They don't have the resources to do that. They don't have friends to come and get them frequently or friends with resources to come and get them. So they're there for an average of 35 days. If you calculate that, just run the numbers, the number of incarcerated homeless individuals, and you come up easily with a million dollars. Now think about the other issues that this community is dealing with. We have a new sheriff who I have not met with yet, and he has already begun to wrestle with the financial difficulties of his office. And so, if we're going to put resource officers in every school, if we're going to recertify the jail, which is overcrowded, we've got to save money everywhere we can. If it's strictly dollars and cents, getting the homeless population out of the justice system's mainstream is one way to save dollars and to make sense out of our jail situation. We're talking about not just a land development project, we're talking about centralizing services. The local architects community has begun to help us with designs and I have put two illustrations over here after the program. Feel free to walk over here and, and look at what they have produced so far. And These were just their first shots at this situation just with a, a charrette that they put together with architects when we first started talking about this. Ways to take the old farmer's market property, almost, well, over nine acres, and turn it into something that, uh, that can serve as a resource for helping to solve this problem. I read the other day someone said, how was this property chosen? Implying perhaps that there was some sinister way the property was picked. Well, first of all, it was for sale. That's an important element. If you're a government and you want to buy land and you don't want to go through eminent domain and all that, it's better that it be for sale. Most importantly, though, if you go to the community kitchen, which I think everyone in this room knows where the community kitchen is and what they do, and as I have often heard, community kitchen is probably the most popular community resource in Chattanooga and Hamilton County, even though they're private and nonprofit. Go to the community kitchen, stand at their front door, turn around, and look across the street. That's where the farmer's market is located. So there's no mystery at all. It's located in proximity to the community kitchen, and we have talked for years about expanding its resources. We have talked about giving them what they need in order to do the work that they do in a better fashion. And I can tell you this from having served on the old city commission with Gene Roberts. It was one of his favorite charities, if you want to call it that. It was one of my favorite charities. And we gave them city resources legally and properly. We gave them money. I paved the parking lot for them over the years. If you see the, that uh, streetscaping in front of their location, that didn't happen by accident. That happened because the city has made that a focus of its interest over the years. Well, what about the environmental issues? Do you know about the environmental issues? Yes, I do. It was a city dump. A city dump. That's an important term. It was not a city landfill. Back in the beginning of the last century, the city utilized it for garbage disposal. And we know that uh, we know somewhat about the limits of it. We know that it was it was just uh, filled with whatever was being dumped in the city at that time. That's important because that makes the city a principally responsible party under EPA guidelines. And as Mr. Satterfield back there will tell you, since he, he works in the uh, area of environmental issues, that when you're responsible, the best thing to do is to sit on top of the property and determine what happens to it. We have little pieces of land all over the city that the city is occupying because it's better for us to own it and determine how it's used than others. I also will say, and this is absolutely true, it is not an exotic site. Do not be fearful that you have been eating vegetables and fruit off of that site for the last 50 years. It's not a dangerous location. The, the waste is many feet below. The uh, scary situation that you've heard about in the news about the 
uh, coal tar that was discovered there back in the 1970s when we were drilling looking for groundwater to to cool and heat the TVA complex. That coal tar was found at about the 150 foot level. It's far below any location that you would come in contact with and it's related to an old gasification plant that's next door. We know about the environmental issues of that property. We are part of the responsibility for that. But it can be used and will be used uh, for the community's benefit and as we have said all along, if questions continue to arise, we can use it for public works purposes. But here is the issue. How can we address the needs of the homeless in this community? And you might have seen the website, you might have seen the references to the group that is proposing that we should stick to the blueprint. Stick to the blueprint. Actually, you can go in on the website. Just type in Google, stick to the blueprint, and it will pop up. Here's the blueprint. It's on our website. You can link to it from that website. We are happy to stick to the blueprint. That's how we started in this process in the beginning. I won't read you all these tabs, for which I'm sure you will be eternally grateful. But this is how the blueprint relates to what we're doing. I will read you one item here, which is where this all started. And this relates to the community kitchen. Too many tabs. Establish a drop-in center that provides a safe place for homeless people to go during the day. For years, we've talked about the need for a day center, the need for a place where the homeless could go other than being in the library, other than being wandering throughout downtown and wandering throughout near downtown neighborhoods. A day center. The community kitchen has been pushing that for a long time. And that's where this all began. When I, my administration first took office, I met with Charlie Hughes and Ron Fender at the community kitchen, and I said, where are you with the idea of a day center? And they said, well, we were thinking about it because they had no more land on their side of the street and didn't think that going anywhere else was an option of going down underneath their present facility. Do you remember the flood that wiped out their food supply? a few months ago. It's a stormwater flood. It's the kind of flood we cannot control and it did happen and will happen again. So they were looking at investing hundreds of thousands of dollars into a space that was really not sensible. And I said, well, if the city could do something across the street, would you be interested in utilizing part of that property? And they said, absolutely. That's where it all began. And that, friends, is in the, in the blueprint. Read it. There are nine recommendations in this blueprint. I reread it this morning because I read that letter in the paper this morning that said there were nine points. I read every one of them and everything that we're doing relates to just what we're doing. It relates to the blueprint. There are a number of other issues. Uh, the, the day center is the first part of the plan. Uh, the day center could be even located on the farmer's market property or it could be located adjacent to where the community kitchen is now and they could move their thrift store across the prop across the street to the farmers market property that could be done with actually no additional environmental testing the site in question has been certified for its current use it's been used for offices and such since the beginning of time I mentioned Gene Roberts earlier. I did consult with the only living person that I know that knows more about this site than anyone else, and that is Gene Roberts, who grew up in this area. It was his famous Onion Bottom beginnings. This was called Onion Bottom because it was a city dump. It was burning. It smelled like onions. And Gene came to my office, and we took out maps, and he showed us where the limits of the, of the dump were according to his memory, and I said, what about these buildings up here on 11th Street? And he said, they were there when I was a little boy. So the buildings have been there a long time. I don't want to get into how old is Gene Roberts, but most of you know him pretty well. If those buildings were there when he was a little boy, that's long enough for me. That means that we can use them for whatever we need to use them for 
uh, consistent with uh, the current uh, environmental approvals for that property. And those are the kinds of things that relate to any piece of property downtown, not just to the farmer's market, to any piece of property that we use downtown. You have those questions to address. There are two shelters that I mentioned earlier, the Rescue Mission and the Union Gospel Mission, located in places that they do not need to be. And one of them, the Rescue Mission, is located in the middle of the M.L. King neighborhood. And a few weeks ago, they proposed to move to the old Oak Grove School. And the Oak Grove community rose up and said, no, thank you. We really don't want you here. These things fall into that category of land uses that I have always found myself dealing with called not in my backyard land uses. Not in my backyard. We're happy for you to do this somewhere else. You might recall that I was once responsible for the city's landfill when I was public works commissioner. I also dealt with the sewage treatment plant, all those things. But I can tell you that in the very beginning of my career, a little over 30 years ago, Gene Roberts, once again, who was at that time the fire and police commissioner, and I was just a young city planner, sent me out to Brainerd to tell the neighborhood around Tacoa Circle Park that we wanted to put a fire station in the middle of their community. I got out to the Brainerd Golf Course Clubhouse. It was filled to capacity, not with people who were there to talk about golf. They were there to talk about the fire station, and they were not happy. Would you believe that something as seemingly benign as a fire station is something that people do not readily welcome? Why? Because it's changing the status quo. I can also tell you, having been at it from the other direction, that it's very difficult to remove a fire station from a neighborhood once it's already there. That's another one of those interesting things about human nature. When you change status quo, you get controversy either going or coming. But I honestly believe, and I do not resent it, that a lot of the problem or the controversy surrounding what we're proposing to do here at the farmer's market relates to that, just that, the community's fear of what could happen. And once it's done, I think that everyone will be pleased. In fact, many people will think it was their idea. That was the case with the aquarium. That was the case with the two-way streets. That's been the case with almost everything of any real significance that we have done in this community. I could stand here and talk about elegant little details about how all this works, but simply this. The whole idea here is to give the community kitchen room to expand and do what they need to do. To centralize the intake of homeless individuals into the system. Everyone that I know admits that that has to be done. And if you look beyond the blueprint, if you look at federal resources, this morning I was handed, when I met with the uh, with the coalition members, I was handed a document that I had never seen before, which was an evaluation of communities that were dealing effectively with the homeless situation. One thing that stands out in this executive summary of that evaluation of communities that are dealing effectively, and Chattanooga is not in the list, is that we should have a centralized point of entry for all the individuals to get into the system and let the agencies do their work. It also goes on to say, and I'm glad the congressman here is here to hear this, uh, these strategies have always been encouraged and are sometimes funded by the federal agencies involved here. So we might ask them to help us out. I know the congressman will, but the federal agencies have to be convinced that this is something that is going in the right direction. It's an elegant solution. I don't resent people raising questions. And that's one reason that I'm here today. That was the reason that I met with the group this morning, to go with the blueprint in hand, to show that we've gone through it, and to ask the question, what are the fears, what are the concerns, what else do we need to be dealing with? Controversy? Yes. Turbulence? Yes. That's how communities get things done. So I've left about 10 minutes for your questions, but I thank you for letting me come and share this with you today.
Yes, Carl. I've lived here long and prophesied. We know that. See there? Uh, when I was talking with a neighborhood group, a collective neighborhood group about this the other evening, and someone stood up and said, well, I think that it ought to be done, but it ought to be on the outskirts of town. And I said, now, where might that be? There was a long silence. I have among my collection of illustrations from my landfill days a political cartoon that ran in the Nashville newspapers back when they were wrestling with the issue of where to locate a landfill. And it's a whole line of people holding signs saying, dump it on his land, you know, all the way down. Well, anytime you're dealing with something of this nature, people are all in favor of it, but they want it somewhere else. And we are not mandating that the rescue mission or the gospel mission should locate to this site. We simply have said, if you choose to move, and they have their own boards of directors and such, and they're faith-based, and they make their own decisions, that I have been told by, I believe, enough members of the council to count a majority, that if you choose to move here, we'll make it very favorable for you to do that. Now, we're willing to wait until you reach that decision. We're not saying pick up and move today, but I do know that there are foundations willing to help them move if they choose to. We're trying to consolidate enough of these types of services so that we can get people out of the state of being homeless and into permanent housing. And you hear from people who say, stick to the blueprint. You've got to get people into permanent housing. Yes, that's true. We can't just go out here and pick someone up off the street and plug them into a house anywhere. There has to be processing. And that's what this is. It's a processing center. It's a place for people to go through to have the opportunity to meet with representatives of the Veterans Administration, Social Security, to link up the services and potential solvers of their problems, AIM Center and so forth, and get them into housing in a way that they can be sustained and maintained. Yes, Rhonda. Yeah, and they will be. No, that's a, and I heard that. In fact, went to other cities, and I did, I did find a guy in Albuquerque. We went to one of their shelters, and they said, we have someone here from Chattanooga. And I said, well, I don't really need to meet that person. But uh, it, it is, it's an urban myth that, that travels around that if you create an area that is too inviting, that you'll be overflowing. Now, I suppose if you created a heaven on earth, that would happen. But all the experts that I have talked with have said that, and first of all, we're not talking about creating a heaven on earth here. We're simply trying to process those that we have. That in almost every community that I have, and I'm always open to any aberrations, that between 80 and 95 percent of the homeless population are local people. You do have some people who travel from city to city. You have some that choose to be homeless for one reason or another. And those will be outside the system because they choose to be. In England, they require people to go inside. I went to a homeless gathering, a homeless um, initiative in New York with Rockefeller Foundation. I've done a lot of work in this area. 
and they had a woman there from England who said that they had less than 500 people in the UK sleeping rough. I'm trying to do her voice badly. Sleeping rough is what they call it in, in England. And I said, well, how do you do that? And they said, we just say, get in, get in. You have to. Well, we have a free land here and they do there too. And I suspect that they have more individuals than that who are still homeless by choice. But we have a lot of people, and again, remember, a lot of these people, a surprising number, are children and families. And that's the most underserved population that we have here. We have housing resources that we need to connect with these people. We have units that are vacant because they are not making the connection through the system to the units. And that's what we're talking about doing. But I am confident that we will not be attracting people here because we will have created such an attractive environment, the farmer's market. We do not have the resources to do that. I am afraid if we tried to pursue the status quo in meeting with the group this morning, they said, we need more caseworkers. Will you fund more caseworkers? And I said, not unless we can find, I, I know the council won't do it, county won't do it, unless we find more effective ways to use the money that we're using already. That's what we're trying to do. Yes, sir. We know that about half of the individuals in any community are are mentally ill, and uh, it depends upon how well you can maintain them in a in an employable state. Every community has said you're going to have some homeless people who you are not going to be able to employ. But again, the most cost effective thing you can do is find some way to get them into supportive housing and stop them from ending up in the emergency room or in jail because that is more expensive than maintaining them somewhere. That's not a large number but it is a percentage that needs to be dealt with so that you free up resources for dealing with others. I, I can't tell you how, what percentage. We know that we have some over 4,000 people who are homeless at any given time in Chattanooga, and we just know that we can do a better job. Talking with uh, Charlie Hughes at the Community Kitchen this morning, he can always walk in with a success story with an individual that they have found who they have linked up with a job and they're simply trying to find housing for them. We have working homeless people who have no place to sleep. We have people, and, and some of the first jobs they get are night jobs, and they have no place to sleep in the daytime because the shelters do not allow people to sleep in the daytime. So we have to find ways to fill these little gaps in our system. I have done what I think the city can do, and I told them this morning, I leave it up to them, those who are experts, to find ways to unify their collective efforts into a more cohesive and effective whole. When I left, they were talking about memoranda of understanding between the different agencies, all those things that are not terribly interesting. I said, all we have simply done is provide the space and it's up to those who know more than I do to say, okay, that was one big barrier. Because they did. They kept hitting that barrier. We don't have a place to do this. Now you've got nine acres. We've got a way to do it. Find a way to put these agencies together. And hopefully, hopefully, we can significantly reduce the number of people who are living on the street under bridges and certainly take care of those family individuals where they're living in cars and, and old vans and wherever. We can do a better job than we have been doing. Yes? Mr. Mayor, uh, I think that regulation is contaminated and said contaminated or uh, perceived to be. Right. And uh, I look at it, I don't understand. The one group is saying it's contaminated, and the other group is saying it's okay to live there. <laughs> so what it's okay to eat there. I mean, you can't. <laughs> Uh, well, again, and I understand all the issues that are raised when something like this comes up. We're in an old railroad station here, and I don't want to start rumors or whatever, but I know this entire area. All, As Carl Levi said, all of downtown is filled with one thing or another. 
and mostly it's the other. And most of it is foundry sand, and foundry sand is something that you don't put under buildings today, but it's all over here. And if you go out in the rail yards here where, where things were transferred and dumped over the years, there's all sorts of stuff out there. The whole idea of using urban space is to, first of all, examine what's there and then find ways to remediate the problem. The Development Resource Center that the city just built and spent $12 million on is built on a site which, if you wanted to call it contaminated, yeah, okay, but it's just an urban site. Farmer's Market is exactly like that. It's like every other site that we've built on all over downtown. And when I say that, people get upset. But it, that's, that's not news to anybody or anybody in a city or an industrial city or a, ra a railroad city. It's not dangerous. We've been eating. You can go down there and eat in the restaurant today. You can buy vegetables on the site today. So it's just a matter of measuring uh, the, the authority saying you need pavement here, you need such and such. You can even separate people from the contamination by earth. And I can tell you, most of the site down there, you've got several feet of earth already, and in many cases, a shelf of concrete, and then more earth, and then pavement, just because of what has trans transpired over the years on that site. So that's not a problem. And we're clear, free to do what we've been doing on that site today by the Tennessee Department of Environmental and Conservation. Uh, to continue to use it for a farmer's market or offices or whatever. So contamination is not the issue. Yes, sir. Hostile? Oh, yes, sir. There are. Oh. Oh, well, back in the middle 80s, Many of the mentally ill were deinstitutionalized, and that led to an increase in the in the homeless population. But well, that and the the way to deal with that is to find and identify those individuals and get them back on their medications. And we have resources to do that in this community. But first of all, you've got to connect with them, and that gets down to that idea of a centralized processing facility, which is what we're talking about here today. My time is up. Thank you. Okay.